good morning and welcome to today's webinar on the Asian Development Bank or ADB's 2020 Development Effectiveness Review. It's a reflection on ADB's achievements in 2020 and its efforts to swiftly meet clients' COVID-19 response needs while supporting long-term strategic priorities. My name is Leslie Behrman Lam, and I'm the representative at ADB's North American Representative Office based in Washington, DC. For today's event, I will provide first some brief introductory remarks, then representatives from ADB's headquarters in Manila will present the key headlines of the report with a spotlight on our COVID-19 response. Following the presentation, we'll have a panel discussion featuring our distinguished guests, Scott Morris of the Center for Global Development and Edgar Rodriguez of the International Development Research Center. We will conclude with the discussion and take some questions from the audience and attendees may submit questions via the Zoom Q&A function. Now to kick things off, I wanted to first provide a few words on ADB. ADB is a multilateral development bank established in 1966 with the purpose of fostering economic growth and cooperation in the Asia Pacific region and contributing to the economic growth of its developing member countries. Of our 68 member shareholders, 49 are from the Asia and the Pacific and 37 are borrowing members. ADB supports its member countries primarily through sovereign or, <clears throat> sovereign or government financing and private sector or non-sovereign financing. The overarching vision of ADB's long-term corporate strategy has been set out through Strategy 2030, which is summarized in the slide that you see now. Strategy 2030 was adopted in 2018 and aims to achieve a prosperous, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable Asia in the Pacific while sustaining efforts to eradicate extreme poverty. Under Strategy 2030, ADB recognizes that development efforts must be tailored to specific local circumstances, and we are working to strengthen our country-focused approach as we prioritize support for the region's poorest and most vulnerable. ADB is working to apply differentiated approaches to meet the diverse needs of our client countries, such as fragile and conflict-affected situations, small island developing states, low and lower middle-income countries, as well as upper middle-income countries. Across these country groups, ADB prioritizes support for lagging areas and pockets of poverty and fragility. I will now turn to my colleagues, Bernard Woods, Lu Shen, and Lindsay Reynaud to present the review. Over to you. All right, good, good morning from the West Coast. Um, and I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the ADB results in 2020. So um, let me just get into the next slide, thank you. Um, as we developed the strategy 2030, we actually also developed the corporate results framework that you see to really comprehensively measure and monitor our progress. Uh, in fact, the current uh, corporate results framework covers six years from 2019 to 2024, and, and it's divided into the four levels, as you can see on the slide. Each level has both results frame indicators, RFIs, and tracking indicators. So if you look at the level one, it's really about the story of the Asia Pacific region. It tracks the collective regional development progress made by ADB, developing member countries, and these indicators are actually fully aligned with the 17 SDGs. Uh, levels two to four are really at the institutional level for ADB. Um, this is where we measure ADB's performance in executing strategy 2030 by setting both the baselines as well as 2024 targets. If you look at the level two indicators, uh, these are actually measuring the results uh, achieved by ADB's completed operations, operations that have finished, and captures not only the alignment with each of the seven operational priorities under strategy 2030, but it also um, looks at the overall quality of our projects and programs. Level three indicators track performance of ongoing projects and operations, things like design and implementation, contribution to development finance, as well as strategic alignment to the strategy 2030 priorities. Level four indicators are measuring the inputs that we put into our operations, how we're doing managing our resources uh, like staff and processes that support our operations. 
At the end of the day, you can see that there are a total of 60 RFIs complemented by 156 TIs. So you may ask, what do we do with all this data? And in fact, this is where the development effectiveness uh, review comes in um, on an annual basis to help us assess and report our performance in executing uh, the corporate results framework using all the indicators as, as a yardstick. So this yearly review and reflection, it's really enables us to spot and analyze uh, performance trends, identify underlying issues, as well as develop uh, actions for improvement. With that, I will pass this on to Lindsay. Over. Thanks, Lou. So the headline finding from our 2020 review is that we were able to swiftly reorient to meet our clients' COVID response needs, all while remaining aligned with our long-term strategic priorities. So by way of quick overview, Strategy 2030 identifies seven operational priorities, which stem from the pressing development challenges in Asia and the Pacific to achieve the sustainable development goals. So as shown here, each of the seven priorities supports the achievement of at least one sustainable development goal. And then we have SDGs six, seven, and nine, which are supported by all priority areas. So our level one indicators, which Lou just mentioned, they're monitoring regional progress. And they revealed this year that the COVID-19 pandemic set progress towards the sustainable development goals further off track. Now, because new data on most sustainable development goal indicators is only available every few years, for our 2020 review, we newly made use of estimates and also projections to assess the pandemic's effects. And I'll highlight the main findings, as you'll see on this slide, related to each of our seven operational priorities. So first in the red box at the top left, we did see economic growth in the region contract for the first time in more than 60 years. Um, and millions of people are estimated to have been pushed back under the poverty line or into near poverty. Secondly, women's economic empowerment has been further threatened by the pandemic, with many estimates suggesting that they are at higher risk of being pushed back into poverty, given that they already had less participation in the formal economy and have also borne a higher share of the burden of unpaid care. Meanwhile, the environmental issues remained pressing in the region just as before, and despite severe economic contraction, greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to have reduced by less than 7% in 2020. And there are more than 5,000 deaths attributed to natural hazards in the region, which added to the toll of the pandemic. Finally, cities in many ways have been at the, at the front line of the pandemic and here crowded conditions and the lack of access to services for all has made it difficult to contain, contain the pandemic in them. And moving to the orange box, um, we look at uh, the children who were stunted in the region, which was already 28% prior. And we know that this is a challenge that pandemic effects have worsened as food security has been exacerbated. In terms of good governance, we did see a slight improvement per the World Governance Index, but it still needs strengthening. And finally, while the foundations of regional cooperation are relatively strong in Asia and the Pacific, many countries looked inward to manage the pandemic, but we know that renewed cooperation will be key to the recovery. So with this regional context in mind, how did we work to address these pressing issues? Our review looks both at completed and new investments to answer this question. So we have a series of indicators to assess the extent to which our completed projects and programs achieved the development results that they were designed to. And in 2020, we had good performance overall in achieving results under our seven operational priorities. A total of 235 completed projects contributed results for the 2020 review. And here we're highlighting just a selection of a few notable results achieved. Now turning to the future and our new investments, our strategy 2030 includes six specific targets guiding ADB's investments until 2030. 
So by 2024, we're aiming to have our private sector projects make up one third of our total portfolio of new projects annually. And just below that, you'll see that by 2030, we're looking to have every $1 of our own financing from ADB for private sector operations matched by $2.50 of long-term co-financing. By 2030, we're also targeting to have at least 75% of our new projects and programs promote gender equality and equally 75% support climate change mitigation and adaptation. And we're also looking to have invested a cumulative total of $80 billion of climate change financing from our own resources. So what was our progress towards these six targets in 2020? Well, this performance you'll see in summary shown by the performance signals in the gray boxes here on the slide. So by way of quick overview on gender at the left in the blue box, our new operations in 2020 did set a record level of gender mainstreaming. And this was driven by a large number of our COVID response operations that really placed a focus on gender equality. So we'll, we were on track, but we will really need to sustain this progress to be on target still in 2030. And this is going to become increasingly challenging, we expect, because we're also pursuing parallel targets uh, shown here on, on the slide, which is needing to also scale up our climate change focus and our private sector operations in tandem, or non-sovereign operations, as we call them. On the climate front in the middle, our project teams did make a concerted effort to integrate mitigation and adaptation into our COVID response operations where appropriate. And the number of climate change operations did grow in 2020, but these formed a smaller proportion of our overall portfolio, which was enlarged by the many health and public sector management support interventions that were required to address the COVID crisis. Meanwhile, our climate financing reached a cumulative total of 10.8 billion for 2019 and 2020. However, overall in, in 2020, many of our COVID response operations did not necessarily have entry points for climate. And some of our larger uh, climate mitigation and adaptation projects did get postponed. So progress on these indicators slowed relative to the previous year, but they're still rated on track although to watch, as you'll see by their amber signal there, signifying that we do have time to catch up, but we'll need to ramp up our climate focus in the next few years to do so. Finally, in terms of our non-sovereign operations, we fell off track on this front in terms of increasing their share in our overall portfolio. And this was mainly because of the big increase in the number of sovereign operations that we needed to uh, approve to support governments with their COVID responses. And likewise, we did not move the needle as much as previous years on increasing our co-financing ratio for private sector operations. So that's a quick overview of our performance from last year. Before I pass it over to Bernard to share about our COVID response work a little bit more, I wanted to let you know about a neat new platform that we recently launched. So this virtual exhibit, which we've titled Results Reality, is the latest in our ongoing efforts to bring the lives and experiences of our end beneficiaries closer to all of our other stakeholders. So through 360 degree interactive video clips, photos and data, this exhibit offers visitors a window into the lives of communities served by our water supply and sanitation projects serving small towns in Nepal. So what we've done is we've uh, captured people's daily struggle for water at the baseline uh, we, we've profiled the ongoing changes being made to better their situation through ADB supported investments and the effects of these on the community and the people within it. So we're really looking forward to when we can finally go back to in-person events and hold the physical exhibit. And this is going to provide a much more immersive and interactive experience using augmented and virtual reality headsets. So hopefully that day will come sooner rather than later. Okay, over to you, Bernard, to share a bit more about our COVID response. Great, thanks very much, Lindsay. So, uh, of course, uh, we couldn't have a complete discussion of uh, the performance in 2020 without talking about uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and ADB's uh, response uh, to that. If I can go to the next slide. 
So this gives you a broad summary overview of our COVID-19 response. Uh, like many other MDBs, we announced a succession of packages, a $6 billion initial package in March, very quickly ramped up uh, by April to uh, $20 billion. And this formed a, a significant portion of the estimated $20, $230 billion uh, contributed by uh, multilateral development banks. Uh, we also uh, changed the way that we work. We streamlined uh, procedures uh, uh, to better uh, and more quickly get our assistance uh, to our uh, developing member countries, including uh, repurposing a, uh, a, a, um, a response option that we had for the financial crisis uh, to support countries uh, for uh, their response to the COVID-19 pandemic. As we all know, the vaccine uh, rollout has been crucial. Uh, in, uh, in November of last year, we announced a $9 billion Asia and the Pacific uh, vaccine uh, facility. And to date, our uh, efforts have, have covered uh, 26 uh, developing member countries, uh, really focusing on uh, the poorest and most uh, disadvantaged. And we've done this in partnership. So through collaboration with WHO, uh, other UN agencies and our uh, development partners, including uh, multilateral development banks. So let me talk a little bit about ADB's COVID-19 uh, response and the, the, the speed with which uh, we did this, because uh, uh, this is a, a critical part of, of, the, of the picture. So uh, really early on, so in, in the end of, uh, of December 2019, we saw the first uh, COVID-19 cases uh, emerging in the, the People's Republic of China. We didn't really know it at the time, we just knew that some uh, kind of uh, strange outbreak of, of pneumonia. But by the 27th of, of January, four weeks later, uh, when uh, the, uh, the initial cases were being uh, reported and only uh, three days before the WHO uh, declared COVID-19 as a public health uh, emergency of international concern, ADB was already acting. So this was on the 27th of January uh, where we were reorienting uh, an ongoing disease uh, surveillance and outbreak response uh, project in, in Lao PDR uh, to quickly deploy funds to respond to COVID-19. So really early on from the outset, uh, already in January of 2020, ADB uh, was engaging and, and uh, reacting. Then on, on March 11th, uh, the day uh, the WHO declared uh, COVID-19 as a global uh, pandemic, we already had uh, seven uh, operations in place, uh, providing uh, $32.3 million of assistance, covering all 40 of our DMCs. <sighs> And then one week later, on the 18th of March, uh, you know, ADB was, was also feeling the, the effects of the pandemic. Most of our staff in our headquarters in, uh, in Manila and our resident missions were shifting uh, to remote working. Uh, we announced our, our first package of $6.5 billion. Uh, this was uh, just 11 weeks after those earliest cases uh, were, uh, were seen in People's Republic of China. Then on the 13th of April, uh, we announced a, a series of, of uh, policy actions and policy variations to respond uh, to the pandemic and an increased package, as I mentioned, of, of uh, 20 billion. We knew our teams needed guidance and support. The businesses, as usual, really wouldn't, uh, wouldn't cut it in this case. So we released a, a series of, of guidance notes on how we would change our systems safeguards, procurement, uh, financial due diligence, uh, results management uh, to really help our operations teams uh, respond uh, to the pandemic. And then early on also, we started tracking all of the COVID-19 uh, policy steps that were undertaken by government. And we put together a COVID-19 uh, policy database uh, of all the, the different steps and data so that our uh, developing member countries could look at this uh, to, to uh, build in their own uh, policy responses and in, in designing their, their COVID-19 and emergency uh, response operations. On the same day, uh, the, the first two of the, uh, the, the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic response option that I mentioned, operations uh, were approved. 
So by the 31st of May, and this is uh, again, very uh, quick when, uh, when you look at uh, the, the, the usual time it takes uh, for, for ADB to put uh, operations in place. 31st of May, we had 52 operations uh, worth uh, 6.6 billion dollars already made uh, available to uh, our developing member countries. Uh, and uh, just seven months uh, after uh, the, the package of, of 20 billion, uh, I mentioned, as I mentioned, we had the uh, Asia Pacific uh, vaccine uh, access uh, facility. So to sum it up, by the end of, of 2020, uh, we had 185 uh, operations uh, totaling $16.3 billion available uh, to our developing member countries, including uh, 26 of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic uh, response options. Uh, that support has continued in 2021, uh, and we now have uh, seven uh, vaccine access projects approved uh, for a total of $1.3 billion uh, in financing. So overall, a very uh, rapid uh, response uh, from the earliest signs of, uh, of those pneumonia cases in People's Republic of China. So in terms of the results, what we've done is we've looked at the, at the operations and pulled out the kind of expected uh, results uh, that we're uh, hoping to see. Uh, these are, of course, very people focused. So uh, 1.1 billion people, almost half of those women uh, expected to benefit in Asia and the Pacific from our uh, support in terms of uh, short term cash or in kind. COVID-19 support. We know that many people uh, were locked down across the region and these kinds of support uh, have really helped people. 4.4 uh, million businesses uh, of which 1.4 million are women owned uh, also benefiting from COVID-19 support. Uh, we've provided uh, testing. So uh, 8.4 million people, including a testing of six, uh, 7.6 million uh, people uh, benefiting from improved health services. Uh, there's been a focus on, on health workers, 2.6 million health workers uh, expected uh, to, to have improved ability skills uh, to tackle uh, COVID-19 and other infectious diseases, and also knowledge. So uh, ADB prides itself on being a knowledge bank and has contributed almost uh, 600 uh, knowledge products designed to respond to the needs of our uh, developing uh, member countries. So to finish off, let me talk a little bit about uh, the kind of feedback. So we, uh, in, uh, in the late uh, latter stages of 2020 and in early 2021, went to our developing member clients across Asia and the Pacific and asked them for their uh, perspectives on our COVID-19 response. Uh, very good uh, uh, ratings on, on speed, on, on advice, knowledge, uh, products, uh, tailoring response uh, to the context. A uh, little less on the, on the size uh, with respect to the needs, but still uh, above 75% and 80% also on the results. So all in all, a, a very difficult time, staff working outside of headquarters on remote work, uh, everybody uh, struggling with the, the personal effects of the pandemic, uh, but really uh, ADB rising to the occasion uh, and really bringing its, its best foot forward in terms of uh, bringing Asia and the Pacific the support it needs it, for the, the COVID-19 response. So let me leave it there and turn it back uh, to Lou uh, for looking ahead. Thank you, Bernard. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. So yeah, looking ahead, and this is really drawing on what Lindsay and Bernard have um, really discussed over overall about the results in 2020, as well as the COVID situation. I uh, just wanted to share with you some of the key actions that we're looking at to improve our performance and address the challenges that the development um, effectiveness review has, uh, has, has really identified. Uh, for example, we are strengthening our approach to monitoring projects during implementation, including how they're delivering against projected development results. We're looking at the private sector operations and their performance um, and looking to improve it by establishing a framework uh, that better captures additionality as well as anticipated development results. We have also really intensified our efforts to improve the sustainability of um, results achieved by our sovereign projects. Uh, we have done a comparative study examining practices for promoting and determining sustain sustainability across development partners. 
Uh, and as Lindsay had indicated, we are also doing well with mainstreaming gender uh, into our project preparation, but we're also making an effort to ensure that we have the hum uh, human resources uh, to achieve the intended gender equity results. And lastly, we continue to support efforts to reach the SDGs uh, through the implementation of strategy 2030. Um, but with COVID, it's really about our deepening our engagement with our clients towards a sustainable recovery from COVID. So with that, I'll pass. Um, oh, next slide. Yeah, so this is really the link to our development um, effectiveness report a review. And so with that, I will pass this back to Leslie. Thank you, Lou, and thanks Bernard and Lindsay also for the presentation. Uh, just moving on to the discussion portion. Uh, again, we are joined by two esteemed guests from both the US and Canadian uh, development research community. We're pleased to have them here to provide insights on the development effectiveness review. So our panelists today are Scott Morris and Edgar Rodriguez uh, to provide brief introductions of each before they provide their remarks. Scott Morris is a senior fellow at the Center for Global Development. His research addresses development finance issues, debt policy, governance issues at, inter at international financial institutions, as well as Chinese development finance. And I think he covers more than that as well. Um, Scott will be followed by Edgar Rodriguez. Edgar is a senior program specialist and Myanmar Initiative Lead at the International Development Research Center. He's an expert on capacity building for public policy, economic development, and labor markets in Asian and Latin American economies. And we do thank you both for joining us today. Uh, first, we'll hear from Scott, followed by Edgar, and then I may pose a few additional questions before we turn back to our ADB presenters for responses. Thank you. Um, great. Well, thanks, Leslie, and thanks for the opportunity um, to, to speak today. And, um, and a particular thanks to your colleagues, um, both for the presentation, but you know, more importantly, for the underlying report. And I have to say, um, those of us in the outside world, I, I hope we can be forgiven for not faithfully reading reports of this sort every single year. Um, but in a year like this, I think, you know, arguably when the stakes are higher, this is exactly the sort of resource that I'm looking for um, to really understand um, how, how the ADB, how institutions like the ADB are performing uh, in the midst of the crisis and, and particularly compared to what, um, you know, what, what normal times performance looks like. And I, I think this, this report is a real resource. So I, I, I wanna uh, compliment you on that. Um, so let me just give um, very briefly a, a list of reactions in no particular order to, to what I saw in, in this assessment. Um, and I, you know, I'm, I'm going to focus really on the, the crisis period. I, that's what's on my mind. I think it's one, what's on uh, everyone's mind, but even analytically, I think that's um, where, where I'm spending my time. So that, that is the nature of my remarks. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I, I, I appreciate and, and, and give credit to the, to the bank for making speed an explicit priority uh, in crisis response. And as much as it, it may seem intuitive, I don't know that it is uh, at the forefront um, of all actors in, in the um, sort of system of finance uh, for developing countries. And I think, you know, it's worth emphasizing the point in the sense that, you know, if we go back to the spring of 2020, uh, at the outset of the crisis, you saw very quickly a diversion as uh, a divergence uh, among countries with the advanced economies uh, providing fast and massive stimulus and response to the crisis in, in their own countries. Um, some sense that it, wouldn't it be ideal for all countries to be able to do this, but then it, we see very quickly in the numbers that um, yeah. you know, uh, developing economies and particularly the poorest uh, were able to do nothing like that. And yet, as, as an operational goal, I think it's exactly you know, th that kind of framework um, ought to be at the forefront uh, of, of how the MDBs were positioning themselves in the crisis, namely, how can we help developing economies maximize their fiscal response to this crisis. Um, everything I see in this report suggests that that was at the forefront of, 
of the policy planning at the ADB. Um, and I think there are good metrics for showing that, that speed was a priority. Um, and we should recognize that it comes, it's not just that it's, um, you know, it puts tremendous burden on staff uh, to move quickly and work long hours. Um, there are real trade-offs in speed. Um, and there are, particularly in the MDBs, I think there is always a tension um, between getting money out the door quickly and, a, and achieving a multiple uh, array of other things. Um, I think one thing that's evident in this report is the degree to which um, an institution has to prioritize what its objectives are, but that in, you know, it, at the same time, it doesn't have to abandon all other objectives. And I think um, you know, the, what we saw in the gender numbers, even in the presentation shows that um, even in a crisis period, uh, where, where fast uh, disbursement is a priority. Um, you know, there are still other areas of priority that um, are all the more relevant in a crisis and can, uh, can be joined with, with uh, crisis finance. Um, and the gender numbers bear out that, that the bank continued to make progress in this area. Um, uh, I would say, yeah, so let me, let me just move on to some other points. Um, I was struck by the very um, flexible uses of, of TA money at, at the institution for the purchase of PPE um, that was highlighted in the report. Uh, what's striking to me is that, um, you know, that it, it did show a crisis mindset. We're going to use everything available to us to do what, what our client countries need. Um, Perhaps more fundamentally, though, it showed the tremendous value of grant resources in, in, a, in an MDB. Um, you know, these are primarily lending institutions, but there are moments, particularly in crisis, uh, where uh, you may need more than that um, to meet your client government's needs in the moment. Um, and uh, I think there's long experience with the MDBs where at a country level, a crisis may hit and you go through a donor fundraising exercise and perhaps you establish a trust fund, um, all of that takes time uh, that, that, that is being lost on the ground. So it was striking and, and really, um, again, to the credit of the institution uh, to tap this money in this way. I think it, you know, pointing to the look ahead on this, I think it, it does point to the need to think about how do we ensure we have these resources available uh, that can be used flexibly. Um, and I am reminded of, uh, uh, the, of the decisions a number of years ago at the bank uh, around the merger uh, uh, of the bank's balance sheet, um, sort of the reorient, well, the, 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 the changes to how fundraising would be done for, the, for supporting low-income countries that, that really, uh, frankly, constrained um, uh, how much would be asked of donors going forward? Um, I think there was a clear rationale for that. But I, you know, I think uh, particularly at a crisis moment, we do see uh, the value and the uses of of grant resources, and I think that deserves some reflection going forward, uh, particularly for institutions that are thinking um, more fundamentally about uh, climate responses and and the needs there. So again, I think. Um, you know the the nature of that TA money, how it was used here. It, let's let's recognize that it was um, um, you know underlying this was the need for grant resources. Um, really impressed, um, and and the analysis that demonstrated how processes were streamlined um, to to prioritize uh, speed. And I I suspect there are probably lessons learned there going forward in two ways. One um, for other institutions, perhaps, and I hope. Um, in the constellation of MDBs, uh, there is a lot of learning that can happen um, post-crisis. Uh, this strikes me as a particularly um, fruitful area to understand how uh, st you know, staffing was reoriented, um, normal processes were uh, streamlined and, and what could be achieved there. I think the other learning is for the institution itself in terms of what um, what could be useful uh, outside of a crisis period? Um, what ways can we sort of perhaps ease up on the way we do things in normal times um, if we see greater value in, in moving more quickly? Um, I would say, um, given you know, that this is uh, an assessment sort of report, I would have welcomed perhaps more critical reflection when it comes to 
uh, the vaccine landscape itself and not so much critical of the ADB as an institution, but really understanding the nature of what's happening uh, in real time with, with vaccine procurement and distribution. Because frankly, um, you know, as an independent observer, if we look, you know, namely at, at COVAX as sort of the or multilateral organizing um, uh, function around vaccines, depending on who you listen to, it's either been uh, performing exactly as intended or it's been a disaster. And it's really hard to assess that. And I would look to, you know, ADB as, as a key source of financing uh, in the vaccine landscape to, you know, um, whether in a report like this or some other way to, to be willing to speak frankly about what are the nature of the barriers here? Um, uh, is it, you know, on the countryside? Is there a problem on the financing side? Are there problems in the rules of the financing institutions? I, you know, I think that's, it would be useful to be able to assess that more clearly. Um, the, at a macro level, the, the, the sovereign private sector numbers were, were striking to me. And I would say, um, you know, where we saw a very significant ramp up and, and in scale and pace of disbursement on the sovereign side, and perhaps um, less so on the private sector side, um, from my perspective, that's exactly as it should be. Um, and I was impressed by that. And I think it actually had me thinking about um, you know, the value of, of the ADB's overall financial model, namely that um, you have a, 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 a single source of capital um, and you have to assess trade-offs in the uses of this capital. How much is going to sovereign lending? How much is going to private sector? Um, and that shouldn't be fixed. Um, it should be responsive to the needs in, in any given year. Um, I recognize that the bank has long-term objectives on scaling up private sector. I think those are um, well conceived, um, but I think in a crisis moment, you know, um, I think um, there is there's there's sort of a, a clear need to emphasize uh, supporting um, client governments, and I, I think that's reflected in the numbers. So I don't see it as um, you know the what looked like bad numbers, frankly, in the rating system on the non-sovereign private sector side, uh, in, in my mind, you know, that's, that's a sign of the bank doing what it should be doing. Um, and then finally, um, just to recognize that the, um, the social protection and health numbers are striking, um, you know, again, reflecting the nature of the crisis, um, ADB clearly responded to where the needs are. And as a result, uh, the institution is much more actively financing uh, in sectors and areas that uh, uh, historically have not been uh, leading in its portfolio. Um, I think that that's going to deserve some reflection outside of the crisis period. I mean, is this, is this a crisis response or are there ways to think about, um, you know, the ADB being um, um, a committed player in this area, if that's where uh, the client countries uh, want to go and need to go. And, and certainly, um, you know, my global health colleagues in my organization are very focused not on just getting through this crisis, but preparing for the next one. So it strikes me that there probably is uh, a case for sustained engagement in ways that uh, even if it, you know, maybe not at the level of, of the financing numbers we've seen in this crisis, but that the bank um, perhaps, you know, could take some time and, and see what lessons learned are for uh, scaling up in this area and, and where the bank want to may want to uh, commit to that uh, going forward. Um, so Leslie, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Scott. Um, turning to Edgar, please. Yes, well, good morning, everyone. My name is Edgar Rodriguez. I am a senior program specialist at the International Development Research Center here in Ottawa, Canada. I'm a development economist by training and have worked on di uh, different aspects of development over my career in Washington, DC, Ottawa, and also in Manila, where I had the honor to work for four years in operations at the, at the ADB and the Southeast Asian Regional Department. So I'm no stranger to the bank's work. I was delighted to accept the invitation and I thank um, the ADB North American office, uh, Lindsay and Laura. And I definitely thank the presenters, Lou, Lindsay and Bernard for a great uh, overview of the report. Uh, first, an obvious comment on my part is to join uh, Scott's uh, praise uh, of the report. 
the development effectiveness review in itself, it's a way to link the bank's performance and its strategy, especially in the midst of a pandemic, is an amazing uh, accomplishment in itself. It keeps, the report keeps the bank's mandate on, on tracking the priorities at a time where development assistance is being uh, contested and argued in Asia, but also in North America and around the world. It fulfills uh, an incredible need for transparency and accountability uh, to stakeholders. And as such, I mean, the Canadian public really is eager and wants and needs to understand more the contribution that it makes to ADB as a non-regional member. So kudos to the report and to at the time, at, especially at this time. I would like to use my time to bring attention to three specific but intertwined long-term priorities central to ADB, uh, ADB's mandate, critical for Canadian development assistance and relevant for the knowledge sector where I situate my own work with the uh, IDRC. The first point is that the bank's operational priority of accelerating progress in gender equality is really brought out quite nicely in the report. This goal is wholeheartedly shared by Canada where a feminist international assistance policy has been in place since 2017. We're one of the very few countries in the world that have that uh, feminist angle to our assistance. Promoting gender equality through the well-being of women and girls is also enshrined in our own new IDRC's strategy for 2030. In particular, I praise the report for paying attention of how women lag behind economic empowerment through market employment. They actually bring up this, this, this uh, important point. It's an area that deserves further attention in Asia because in Asia you face vast interregional differences. For example, the report talks about that less than half of 48% of all Asian women engaged in labor force. That these indicators when you are systematically lower when you look at sub-regions like South Asia, where it's only a 23% of women in the labor force compared to 80% of men. So what does it mean? Such a large gap in employment deserves a lot more attention in the, on the research side um, to guide future banks interventions and to monitor their effectiveness. More is needed to know about how women's time gets to be divided between work and care. For example, is how paid labor and unpaid care interact, especially during the pandemic, because during the pandemic, it has been revealed how vulnerable Asian women are in their roles as caregivers. And, they, and the report pays attention to that. And it's a, a crucial point to make. So we need more investment in knowledge to know how to empower Asian women more using, for example, more, more investment in time surveys to understand better social norms dictating the distribution of time or through more systematic evaluations and to learn about best practices or more effective ways to provide childcare to Asian women. A second point to make, <clears throat> it's around the central operational priority number six, which I think is crucial for, for Asian, is strengthening governance and institutional capacity. The report focuses on improvements in tax collection and highlights some of the successes in the last year on the operational front, such as with an example that they give about the Vietnam's public expenditure policy uh, quality program. As clients of the bank, uh, Asian governments are definitely committed to improving their own performance and effectiveness. And so a question of how could they continue improving this effectiveness is something that of importance, is something where the ADB can, um, is definitely interested and it provides, uh, um, and it provides this, the focus of the report. Uh, one way about improving effectiveness in this particular area is actually mentioned by the World Economic Forum. Economic Forum um, does talk, and this seems to be a sidetrack, but it's actually related. Um, the World Economic Forum talks about how Asian countries have been successful in accelerating women's economic empowerment, but they lag behind women's political participation. And therefore, the gender gap uh, reports published by the World Economic Forum tends to qualify, uh, rank Asian countries lower in terms of governance indicators. So trying to track more how women are represented in the government structures, whether they are officials, members of parliaments, ministers, head of states, regional representatives, can help raise the voice of women when discussing fiscal matters. And that's the connection. 
several uh, Asian governments already do this. They do pay attention to gender budgeting, which deals with the fiscal side of things. It's when public budgeting that considers the needs of the different genders among the population of citizens. So we have an opportunity to engage with governments in gaining greater awareness, undertaking research, and increasing capacity, linking greater gender equality with government effectiveness in the, in, in the tax policies, for example, or in fiscal, in fiscal matters. And this will result in a better development outcome. A final comment uh, that refers to how ADB meets its effectiveness. And I want to praise the report's chapter six on knowledge sector. The first time I see a, 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 a chapter just dedicated to this, to this exchange. What the bank has been able to do in 2020 under a difficult environment is just simply amazing. The knowledge activities not only feed into the bank's operations, they also demonstrate the capacity of the bank to become a leading knowledge and learning organization in the region. So we can only have praise for that. Asia also has like world-class universities, outstanding government and independent think tanks, increasingly sophisticated national research councils and more. All these institutions are, have a lot to offer to ADB. And in a way they are contributing already. ADB engages with them in knowledge seminars at the annual meetings. They engage them through TA efforts such as the Asian Think Tank Network or through a recent example, <clears throat> which is the Southeast Asian uh, Development Solutions Platform, where they showcase some of the technologies and innovations that were available in Asia. These and other knowledge mechanisms provide ways in which national and regional capacities, especially those of the low income member countries of the bank, can grow to assess their own development challenge and the, the, the different ways in which to address them. So what looking forward, what I, I would like to see more is how these expanded opportunities for these knowledge, local or national uh, knowledge institutions and networks can contribute to future editions of the development effective report so that they can show a, a more common front in trying to track development effectiveness in the region. And with this, I would like to stop here and pass it back to Leslie. Thank you. Thank you, Edgar and Scott, very much for your reflections, observations, uh, and comments. Um, I just wanted to, just before turning it over to the team to uh, respond to some of the issues you raised, just highlight a couple of themes that I noticed in your comments. Uh, one is the importance of trade-offs in making decisions. Um, as Scott mentioned, the tension between being quick in your response and the um, uh, you know, the desire to obviously ensure you're achieving all your stated objectives, as well as the trade-off between, you know, how you use your capital, how do you decide how to use, uh, allocate between sovereign and non-sovereign, and Edgar, your responses about, so I, I was struck by the, um, the integration of, of, of everything, capacity building and how gender can, uh, you know, capacity building can be supported by gender and gender can support the capacity building and sort of that interconnectedness, I, I think is very interesting. Um, and it might be interesting to reflect on sort of how we're trying to tie all these themes together through our operations, uh, working thematically and sectorally. Um, just before turning it over, I we did have a, I just wanted to raise a question uh, from the audience and it's, it's, it's kind of, goes back to this, this question of prioritizing and, and um, tension, which is sort of if everybody has to stay at home and uh, because of the pandemic and can't actually physically go to work, but they have to go to work to make money, um, the question is um, sort of what can ADB do to help alleviate some of these, is that tension between needing to earn an income and, and not being able to go out to do so. So I'll turn it over to your team, Bernard. Great, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Scott and Edgar, for those uh, uh, comments. You know, it's, it's always uh, good. We're often working uh, to put these reports together and uh, hearing other people's reflections on these. It's, uh, it's uh, very important. Maybe let me just touch on a, a couple of points from, from each of you. Uh, First, from Scott, uh, talked about these uh, streamlined processes and, and uh, you know, what will stay. And I think 
uh, one of the things has been what we call 180B teams. And now that may sound a little uh, uh, insular to, to some uh, folks on the call, but you know, ADB, we have a lot of silos we're trying to break down. And in the, in the context of the pandemic, to process these operations, we brought people from all the different parts of the bank together and, and formed uh, teams. Now this, of course, was in a time of great stress, a time of great uh, number of work hours, but I think the results uh, of those are, are quite striking in terms of speed and quality. And we didn't trade off quality for speed or quality for priorities, uh, such as focusing on women. So uh, we don't know exactly where this is going to, to shake out, but I would say, uh, uh, these kind of uh, cross-functional teams would be one area that I would uh, would expect to see uh, lasting beyond the, the COVID-19 response. Uh, Scott, you made a great point about uh, vaccines and the terrain and, and all of that. On that, just because the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the vaccine access facility came in so late in the year, wasn't really featured in, in the report, but I expect that would be a uh, a significant uh, focus in, in, the, in the 2021 uh, development effectiveness review. And we'd have a, a whole year of, of kind of vaccine support and context uh, to reflect on. For uh, Edgar, maybe just a couple of, of thoughts uh, on, on gender equality. So, uh, and, and also this is something that, that Scott brought in. And what the data is showing us is we're doing very well on design. So uh, when projects are approved by our board and signed onto by our developing member countries, the designs increasingly, most of them now have uh, gender equality embedded in them. That we can see as a kind of, let's say an 18 month process to get gender right in the design. But where we need to focus really now is on the five to seven years of implementation. So making sure by the time projects end, they deliver on, our gen on the gender equality results that they promised. And we can see that, that we're not quite there yet. There's been a slight uh, decrease in, in, the, in the success rate of those gender uh, components at completion. So I'd say where we uh, need to focus, and, and, and Lou uh, brought this up, is, is uh, you know, design seems to be quite uh, well uh, solved, but also uh, now uh, making sure we, we deliver on, on the promises of those designs. And then Edgar, you also mentioned about uh, women's political participation. So our second uh, operational priority, which is on, on gender equality, has five pillars. One of those is on uh, women's voice and women's participation in decision making. And this is an area where we do measure the results and we're, we're counting and we are, are counting any, any type of, of decision making bodies. So we know women's participation is important in let's say water user groups at the local community level, uh, all the way up to, uh, to national uh, parliaments and, and legislatures. Uh, so we're, we're looking at, at all those different levels and, and counting and, and seeing how uh, women's uh, participation uh, is growing in those uh, areas. I wouldn't say it's a, a strong traditional area for uh, the Asian Development Bank being an infrastructure bank, but it, I think it is something that's getting in increasing focus. And finally, the, the question from the audience, it's a great one. I think we're all, uh, all um, uh, experiencing that. Uh, maybe in the short term, uh, clearly the response has been getting support into the hands of people who are under lockdowns, businesses that have been uh, forced to close, uh, you know, uh, billions of dollars, millions of people reached uh, and, uh, and uh, businesses reached through that. In the longer term, ADB is putting more of an emphasis on digitization. So uh, looking at the connectivity, how a digitization can work in, in those uh, kind of circumstances. So I'd say no magic bullet there, but uh, uh, some definite short term and long term uh, solutions that we're working on. Not sure if other uh, colleagues want to come in. Scott or Edgar, did you want to jump in to respond or? Yes, and um, just to elaborate on the point of the political participation, um, my point there, uh, Bernard, is to exactly use that uh, power that you have on the uh, the, the operational priority number two and trying to inter in, uh, integrate it or to bring it up in the operational priority number six, which is about uh, strengthening a governance and institutional uh, capacity. So you might find that you actually have accomplished a lot more than you think you have 
um, even in that in that area, because having women's representation, even at the local level, you already see that you have some very successful rates in your, for example, when you look at operational priority four on managing cities, um, on water and sanitation projects, where you do have a lot of participation from women, that, for example, brings out the fact that you are paying attention to that very large segment of the population. So I think that there's a lot there that could be celebrated. Uh, in fact, you see it more at that local level, maybe not so much at the national tax level. That's what I was talking about, about gender budgeting um, for the entire country. But at the local level, at the city level, you do see uh, a great progress. So again, kudos to the ADP for looking and tracking um, these uh, indicators um, overall, very important. Okay, um, thank you, Edgar. Just uh, kind of picking up on, on one of the points that Scott raised as well in his intervention, um, sort of, and Lou, you, you, you focused on this in, in, at the end of the presentation, which is looking forward and moving ahead. And obviously we look back, but we look back to inform how we want to move ahead. And I guess it would be interesting to know if ADB, how ADB is planning to um, integrate some of the lessons learned from our experience in the COVID and, and learning you know, to be more agile, to be quicker in our response. And in that connection, this is uh, also picking up something Edgar, you said, which is about the importance of partnerships and the importance of, of you know, working with the communities. And uh, maybe you could kind of touch on that theme a bit. Bernard or, or, or Lou, do you want to jump in? Lou, do you want to jump in or do you want me to go? Um, if you could go ahead, that that's, that would be great. Thanks. great. Thanks. So I think a lot of the story, and, and this is also one where maybe we haven't finished telling it, is at the, the level of the countries with what we call our resident missions. So these are uh, our offices, whether it's in Ulaanbaatar or in, in, in Suva, in Fiji, where we have a, a, a mixture of staff working uh, side by side with government, the private sector uh, communities. And I think looking at what they've done uh, in the context of, of our COVID response, when you know, we have a model where uh, a lot of people travel from Manila to those countries to, to process uh, projects, and that just wasn't possible. So I think those partnerships at the local level really, really uh, allowed us to respond uh, in the way that we did. And again, I think those are the kinds of, of, of sort of lasting changes. I think we're, we're taking a look at the, the strengths of those resident missions and how we can uh, continue to, to build on that. And that ties in, I think, to knowledge because those uh, colleagues, they're the closest to our, uh, our government uh, uh, counterparts. Uh, they're knowing uh, what the kind of knowledge needs are. They're engaging in, in policy dialogue. So I think uh, uh, an increased focus moving forward is really, uh, really uh, the, the strength and the value added of our, of our uh, resident missions, our offices uh, across Asia and the Pacific. Maybe I'll, I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Thanks, Bernard. Um, I think at this point, we're coming to the close of, um, of the webinar. I just, Scott or Edgar, if you had any last words that you wanted to raise, if not, we can um, close it out. Well, I just okay. wanted to, to, to mention, to go back to a point that Lindsay um, mentioned about the regional integration and how this is uh, changing with the end of the pandemic or the opening uh, recovery uh, side which is very important to open up. And this is exactly, I guess, uh, trying to turn the page on the lockdown mentality and just trying to figure out what are the best ways of engaging in a post-recovery um, stage that looks more, at, pays more attention to climate change, to gender equality and all other aspects that probably have been neglected in the past. So it's a great opportunity um, to look at those long-term development challenges that have been there and that they have been exacerbated by the, by the pandemic. And Leslie, maybe I'll just say briefly, you know, you, you made this, you emphasized the, the question of forward looking. Um, and as I think ahead to your report, this report next year, 
um, you know, there is one sort of analytical feature that I think is a challenge in the sense that you, you know, you have these, I don't know, three or four year averages. Um, and again, recognizing the nature of the crisis, you do see a deterioration in some of the standard measures um, where we would look at it and say, well, that's because of the situation we're in. Um, I think that's not just an anal analytical challenge. It does point to at a higher level for the ADB think to think about, you know, what are we measuring? Um, how do we think about crisis? Um, not just as a once in a generation thing, but perhaps this is something we're going to be facing again. So, you know, even as an analytical measure, um, how do we rethink what we are measuring, what's important to us and setting strategy? And, you know, I, so I would encourage both to anticipate perhaps what might be some bad marks next year, frankly, in some areas, but also to think about um, what's the fuller narrative there and, and how do we complete that picture? Thanks. Great, thank you so much. So um, at this stage, I'd like to thank Scott and Edgar, our ADB presenters and everybody else joining us from Asia, the US, wherever you may be. Um, we appreciate you, you taking the time to join us. Um, and we at the North American Representative Office uh, look forward to continued engagement. And with that, we conclude today's webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.